Thank you uh, for inviting me. It's great to be here uh, in Canberra. Um, I was thinking um, how to motivate this talk about the global economy, and I think that the, the question we have been asking since 2009 has not changed. Uh, in the trough of the crisis, we were asking the shape of the recovery for the global economy, and that question is still the same. So what I'm going to do today, uh, I'm trying to answer this question. Um, before I do that, I need to advertise uh, uh, these two important publications. One of them is the Global Economic Prospects. Uh, we release January and June every year that looks at the global economy, provides detailed forecasts. And the other one is the Commodity Markets Outlook. We uh, release this publication four times a year. World Bank uh, forecasts all commodities uh, till 2025. Uh, this is, I think, uh, quite uh, relevant, especially for this audience. Now, um, the, the talk uh, is about disappointment, divergences, and expectations. What do I mean by that? When we look at the global economy, we see a slow-moving recovery. And uh, disappointments are there, mostly about the growth. There are important drivers of the global outlook. Three of them are there. The first one, low commodity prices. It's all positive. The second one, easy financial conditions, has been around. It's all, all also positive. But the third one, the weak global trade, that's dampening the growth. When we look at the country groups, what we see, divergences. Divergences we see in the context of advanced economies, divergences we see in the context of emerging markets, and now new divergences appear in terms of oil exporters, oil importers, or commodity exporters, commodity importers. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask three questions today. What is the state of uh, global recovery? What are the main risks? And what are the main policy issues? Now, let me start with the first question. What is the state of global recovery? Global economy is simply limping along. What does that mean? When we look at the global growth since 2010, this is the blue line here, the bars, what you see is that Every year, the global growth was smaller than the previous year or was almost flat. From 2014 to 15, that's not changing much. The growth is going to accelerate from 2.6 to 3 percent. But, but uh, overall, global growth is going to remain weak. Now, for high-income countries or the advanced economies, what we see is uh, sluggishness going forward. For the developing countries, though, the good news is that growth slow from 2013-14, that was bad news, but now from 14 to 15, growth is going to pick up. Just uh, some numbers, these are always boring but good to look at. Uh, growth is going to pick up for the world economy, as I mentioned. For high-income countries, we see a pickup as well, mostly because of the U.S. economy. For developing countries, as I mentioned, growth went down from 4.9 to 4.4 from 2013 to 14, but we think that it's going to pick up in 2015. East Asia Pacific is going to slow down very gradually, but it's still the fastest growing region in the world. Now, I talked about disappointments. Let me explain what I mean by that. These two lines tell you about the global growth average prior to the crisis, 2003 to 2008, and after the crisis, 2010 to 2013. After the crisis, growth was rather meager. You hope that you will basically eventually accelerate and get to the pre-crisis growth rate. Now, how did we see the world economy in January 2014? We thought that growth is going to accelerate when we come to 2015, and maybe 2016 we will get to that, you know, the growth rate average we had prior to the crisis. Now, we came to June 2014, we reduced our growth forecast for 2014. And then we came to January 2015, we reduced our forecast for 2014 and 15 as well. So there were multiple disappointments. 
Now the question is that why did we revise our forecast downwards in 2014 and 15? The answer is very clear. Some parts of the world have been performing much weaker than what we thought. In the context of advanced economies, those parts are Euro area and Japan. In the context of emerging markets, those parts are Brazil and Russia. So most of the forecast revisions were due to those four economies. One economy surprised on the upside, and that was the United States. Now, the drivers of global outlook, as I mentioned, three factors. One, low commodity prices, mostly oil. The second one, easy financial conditions. These two are supporting global growth. And the third one is weak global trade. That's basically dampening global uh, growth. Now, what about low oil prices? So there has been an unusually sharp drop since June 2014, mostly driven by supply factors, but a little bit of weaker demand as well. The decline in oil prices has been larger than the declines we observe in other commodities since their peaks in 2011. We think that the prices are going to remain weak in 2015 and 16. Low oil prices is good news for the global economy. If price decline is around 45% on annual basis from 14 to 15, we think that that adds global GDP around 0.7 to 0.8%. Having said that, there are multiple mitigating factors that will affect the beneficial impact of oil price decline on global growth. We still live in an environment of weak confidence, the legacies of crisis, especially high debt, still there. In the past, when oil prices went down, central bankers responded by basically reducing interest rates. Now, that's quite difficult, especially in the context of large central banks. So there is also a monetary policy constraint. Of course, the relationship between oil and activity has been changing. The intensity of oil use in production has been declining. There is reduced investment in new oil exploration. That's a negative, and, and there is, in general, weak demand. Now, what do we see when we think about oil prices and the prices of other commodities? Other commodity prices, agriculture and metals and minerals, have been going down after reaching their peaks in 2011. On the other hand, oil price, till last year, June, picked up, mostly because of geopolitical tensions. Those tensions disappeared. There was acceleration uh, of expansion in supply from unconventional producers. The major cartel, OPEC, responded to that by announcing they are not going to basically intervene. They are going to let the, uh, the market to determine the price that translated into a free fall in oil price. Now, what do we think uh, is going to happen to oil price? Uh, we think that from 2014 to 15, oil price is going to go down around 45 percent and will remain weak for 2016 as well. What about commodity prices? Um, in the latest commodity price, uh, commodity markets outlook, uh, we basically forecasted that in all commodity price indices we look at, prices are going to go down in 2015. There will be a small recovery in 2016. Now, easy financing conditions have been with us for a while and will be with us for the foreseeable future. Here, the major players are the euro area and Japan. And this graph is very interesting because it tells you something very interesting. Market participants expect that in the context of Euro area and Japan, policy rates are going to be close to zero as far as the eye can see till 2018. They think that in the US, interest rates are going to increase sometime this year. But they're going to increase very gradually. And actually, they are now thinking that the increase in interest rates is going to be even smaller than what they thought last year in May. 
Irrespective of all of these developments, when you look at 10-year bond yields, they are still at all-time record lows. What about global trade? Prior to the global financial crisis, trade was growing at around 7% per year. In 2012 to 14, that number went down to 4%. The both cyclical and structural reasons behind this important development that affects all small open economies, including Australia. Now, on the one side, the cyclical reason is rather obvious, weak demand. On the other side, we have this structural change between activity and trade. In other words, when global GDP increases, the response in trade has been smaller than what it used to be. One reason for this is that we used to see rapid expansion of these global supply chains, especially relevant in East Asia Pacific region. That rapid expansion has been maturing. With that, we see a smaller response of trade to changes in activity. The question is how long this change will be with us. We think that for the foreseeable future, global trade is going to remain weak and, and is going to have a negative impact on growth. Now, 2015 is going to be a year we will ask this question multiple times. Can advanced economies support global growth? When we think about advanced economies, actually the one we are thinking about is the bright spot, the United States. United States can support global growth up to a point, but not more than that. UK is also accelerating. That's also good news. But on the other side, you have Euro area and Japan. This is a great divergence we see within the context of advanced economies. What is going on is that you see a little bit of acceleration, both in Euro area and Japan. But growth is still going to be around 1, 1.2% in both of these large economies. Corresponding to that, you see a great divergence of monetary policies as well, and that will have implications in terms of financial market volatility. What about developing countries? There, as well, we have a mixed outlook and new divergences emerging. In the case of China, we foresee an orderly slowdown. For commodity producers, exporters, Times are going to be challenging. Brazil, Russia, and South Africa will miss the days they used to have much higher growth rates. Brazil will have a tough time in 2015. Russia will probably have an even more difficult time. There are some reformist governments. One of them is India. We think that India's growth will accelerate and in 2016 will reach to 7%. Mexico as well will see a higher growth in the coming years thanks to structural reforms the government has been undertaking. Now, what about the risks? It's clear with this outlook, downside risks still dominate. What are those risks? Volatility in financial and commodity markets, normalization and divergence of monetary policies, secular stagnation in the euro area, geopolitical tensions, disorderly slowdown in China, and medium-term slowdown in developing countries. Given the interest, I'm going to talk a little bit about the case of China. What's the big problem in China? These two figures tell you that problem. On the one side, you have a very large debt stock accumulated in a very short time period. Prior to the crisis, total debt was around 160%. Now, it's around 260%. While debt is accumulating, growth has been slowing down. That's the figure on the right side. This is an explosive combination in an, any economy. In a short time period, observing a dramatic slowdown in its growth, but at the same time, a dramatic increase in its debt. In the case of China, we think that it has ample buffers to mitigate a slowdown. Now, let me briefly talk about those buffers. First, as much as debt is large, in the case of China, public debt is still rather small. It's around 60%. So if China wants to undertake fiscal stimulus, it can do that. If China wants to bail out certain entities, financial, non-financial, 
It can do that. It has the ammunition. Second, China has ample institutional buffers. Sovereign debt, dominantly domestic, financial system mostly state-owned, and capital controls preventing sharp capital outflows. Third, China has very large foreign exchange reserves. So, in summary, it's difficult to envision a scenario. China is having an outright debt crisis, the types of debt crisis we have seen in emerging market economies. It's difficult to envision a scenario. China is having a sudden stop, the types of sudden stops we have seen in emerging markets. And ultimately, it's difficult to envision a scenario China is having a currency crisis, the types of currency crisis we have seen in emerging market economies. Briefly, let me turn to the third question. What are the main policy issues? There are multiple policy challenges, but at the same time, these challenges provide windows of opportunity. Monetary policy is something we talk about a lot. Here, it's going to be a challenge for central banks to think about growth, inflation, and current stabilization. This is going to be a tough balancing act, and the bank Reserve Bank of Australia is having that challenge as well. Help from low oil prices in net importing countries provides an opportunity, though, at least temporarily. I'm going to talk about fiscal policy and importance of having fiscal space to run effective counter-cyclical fiscal policy. The speed of expanding fiscal space, of course, depends on country circumstances, and that provides an opportunity in this challenging environment. As always, structural policy is important, and we think that low commodity prices provides a window of opportunity to undertake timely subsidy reforms. Now, let me talk about a little bit emerging markets and frontier markets and the fiscal challenges they have, given the interest of the audience. Now, when we look at these emerging and frontier market economies, the first thing we see, deficits are now larger than they used to be prior to the crisis. But at the same time, if you look at government debt, government debt actually is rather stable. In an environment when you have larger deficits, but somewhat stable government debt, what's going on? These countries implemented expansionary fiscal policies during the crisis effectively. They were able to stimulate their economies. But since then, they haven't built up their fiscal buffers to be able to contract uh, if they have a growth slowdown. As much as government debt is stable in emerging and frontier market economies, the big problem is that private debt has risen. Private debt has risen uh, dramatically, especially in some of those countries. They enjoyed credit booms because of the easy financing conditions. Now, when financing conditions are easy, it is good to basically undertake uh, the, 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 the expansions, credit expansions, but financing conditions can change dramatically. And it did in the past. Russian crisis is an example, global financial crisis is an example. During these periods, private debt can overnight become public debt, and it will be very difficult to counteract th this type of change. And we, as we have seen in Indonesia, Thailand, Ireland, and Latvia, countries will have uh, very difficult circumstances. I'm going to uh, tell you one more thing about the fiscal policy. It's very important for countries to have fiscal space to undertake effective counter-cyclical fiscal policy. In other words, when you have lower deficits and lower debt stocks, it is easy to see a larger return when government expands an additional dollar. In other words, fiscal multipliers are larger when you have more fiscal space. Structural reforms, always a long list, but we think that it's important to undertake subsidy reforms uh, in this period. I ask three questions. One, what is the state of global recovery? The simple answer is that global economy is limping along, helped by commodity prices and easy financing conditions, but held back weak global trade. Divergences and disappointments are the important words in different country groups. 
What about the risks? Downside risks dominate the outlook. What are the main policy issues? There are many challenges, but also, also windows of opportunity. Now, let me turn to what I asked at the beginning. Uh, from 2009 to 2015, every year, we started the year asking the question, what will be the shape of the recovery? We are still asking this question, and uh, I think that I did my best to answer it, probably I did not answer it, but that gives me an opportunity to come back to Australia next year. Thank you.